Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and this is a really important month. It is Sexual Violence Awareness Month. And I know if you tuned in here with me a few times, and you know we've talked about this a lot. We talk about um, the sexual violence hotline that you see on there. If you are someone that is in need, please don't feel like you're alone. You do not need to be stuck in the violence all by yourself. There are advocates out there. There are people that would love to help you. And there's other people that have gone through what you're going through now. I'm one of those people, which is what sort of motivated me to even want to have this show to begin with, so that we have a safe place for survivors to come out and tell their stories. We even have a website that you guys can send me your stories at, there you go, Survivor Central at thinktechhawaii.com. And if you send me your stories, I can either read them out on, on the air or I can have you come onto the show with me and, and you can share them with people. I think it's important for us to network together, to work together, to learn from each other, right? You can see what someone else has done to get through it and maybe it'll help you get through it. Or if you've got something that you did to help yourself get through it, be bold, have courage, and come out and share those things with other people so that they will have a path to follow. Today I am here with Donita Garcia, who is a survivor who's been through a lot. She has a really important story for you guys to hear because she's come out the other side in an amazing way. Donita, I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being brave enough and having enough courage to come out here and tell your story. Um, so let's start with a little bit of, of your history and some of the things maybe that you've gone through. And whatever you feel like sharing, I want you to feel really comfortable and know that you don't have to share anything that, that you're not comfortable talking about. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today because uh, my purpose is to really be an advocate for people, for women, uh, for men mm -hmm. that, that need to know that, you know, there's places to go to get help, that there's people that have been through what they have been through. I've been through quite a lot in my in my six decades plus of life. No way, you don't look like you've been around that long, girl. You certainly don't. You look really great. Uh, but if we're, we're first talking about sexual abuse, my, my, uh, I've been married three times, and my second, second husband was a physical abuser. And um, we were married uh, five years, um, and he hurt me badly at least twice. There was other times, but I mean, um, not nothing really to, to share about. But the very first time was I remember we were um, walking home from work. It was at night, and we just lived a short distance away. And for some odd reason, I don't even know why, and I can't even remember why. He just got really angry, and at first he punched me and pushed me down and ripped my clothing, and just started dragging me through the field by my hair and my shoulders. And by the time we got home, I was just like so scared because he had never done that before. Right. You know. I had heard that he was like that from other friends before I had met him. But, you know, of course, we think that, you know, our love is going to win and that, you know, he won't do that to me. We can change him. Yeah, right. Right. You know, but it doesn't <laughs> happen. You know, well, for, for me, it didn't happen anyway, you know. And um, the other stories that I've heard during my time is they, they never change, you know, no, unless they, they get help, professional right. help. They're not going to change. Right. So, um, and that was very traumatic in itself because I had never been in that kind of situation. I had a husband before him, and that husband never did hurt me and physically. And um, so the second time that he physically abused me, we were at home, and he just started, once again, out of the blue, punching me, throwing me up against the wall, oh and back and forth against walls, you know, to the point where um, it was really to the point where I thought he was going to hurt me badly. And so I wow. went in the bathroom and, and I started <sighs> pretending like I was throwing up and I told him they broke my ribs just so that he would stop, you know, because I didn't really think that he was going to stop. Right. And during this time, right after that, my right before he had stopped, 
My friends had come to the door because they lived nearby and heard the commotion, and he wouldn't let them in, and he wouldn't let me go to the door. And so I could just hear them out there, and he's, he's like, he's got the door kind of like shut, and, and he's going like this to me, telling me not to say anything, or else he would hurt me more. I knew that's what that meant, you know, I just right. knew. So um, that was very hard, you know? But, yes, and I sure left him a number of times, and, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it always went back, because, you know, you just, because they say sorry, they say they love you. It's called the honeymoon stage. Yes, exactly. You know, and, <laughs> In the cycle, there's a cycle, and, and there's the explosion, the honeymoon stage, right? And then there's, after that, you kind of go back into a, a peaceful sort of a time there, and then there's the incident, and then there's the explosion, and then there's the honeymoon stage, right. and the whole thing starts right. over it's again. A, it, it's a vicious circle. It is. You know, and so I, I would go back, because I already had one failed marriage, and I didn't want to have another one, because I had watched my father being married five times and my mother being married three times. Wow. And I didn't want to be, you know, walking in those paths. but. You know, so I tried my best, but, you know, the la the very last time before I left him for good was, you know, things had been okay for a while, but I just felt it. It was just this incredible feeling of doom coming and that he was going to hurt me again, and I got out for the last Good time. for you. Yes. And, you know, that's an important thing for you out there that are watching. If you have that feeling, trust your instincts. Don't just dismiss it. Oh, no, this time he'll be okay Trust your instincts and get out before it happens instead of waiting until after the fact. I think that's an important thing for Absolutely. people to remember. Or some way, somehow, get a message to somebody, you know. Yeah, there's always I mean, a way. I know there's, time, there's women that have been, you know, like locked up and, and right. not allowed to communicate with the outside world. But there's always a way to get that, that word out that you're being abused. Some way, somehow, a neighbor, the mailman. I mean, uh, someone, anyone. Someone. Absolutely. And you know, another thing to remember, too, is to be really careful about how you tell. Because you don't want to get yourself in a, um, in a worse situation where he's going to retaliate against exactly. you. You know, and, and that's something that I know happens. Yeah. So I know you were telling me when we were talking about um, having you come on the show and stuff, we were talking about some of the stuff that had happened to you when you were a kid. Are you yes. comfortable talking about that at all? Sort of the things that led you up to get into this kind of a relationship, yeah. right? Well, from the age of five, I was, I was uh, sexually abused by two cousins. Oh. And then at the age of, and never told anyone because I always felt like it was my fault because um, I grew up in the desert and it was very hot and so our, my stepmother would uh, not put shirts on us. So I thought it was my fault because I didn't have a shirt on at five Aww. years old. And from that, oh, after so that happened, that. I always oh. wanted a shirt on. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's amazing what will go through your head even at five years old. Right. Uh, but yeah, I absolutely. never did tell anyone. And then at 13, one of, because that was two cousins from two different sides of family, one of those cousins did it again at 13. And this time he, he, he raped me. Okay. Oh, my God. Yeah, still never told anyone because I thought it was my fault because I allowed it to happen when I was five years old. This is what was going through my sure, brain. Right? right. Then at the age of 15, um, my boyfriend, who had been in the mainland, his brother had come over, who was a best friend of my father, came over to tell me we were going to the airport to get my boyfriend. He was coming back from the mainland and took me out to the to the bushes and raped me. Oh, don't even. I'm then so sorry that happened to you. Threatened to, uh, to kill my father if I told the police. Oh, my gosh. And I told my father, but my father was very scared of him, and nothing uh -huh. ever happened. We never, the police were never notified of nothing. Oh, my gosh. And the last one, I was 18 years old, and I met this guy at the laundromat, and he asked me out for a date. And I had just moved to Lawrence, Kansas from Hawaii, and I didn't know anybody. And I thought, wow, this is a way to get to meet somebody, you know, and maybe meet some other friends, you know, and start, right. you know, start, start a friendship, you know, with, with people. And so I, I said, yes, well, of course, you know, the first thing he wanted to do was stop by his house because he forgot something. But I'm 18 years old, and I'm not thinking anything. Now, today, I know all the signs, right? So we go to his house, and he invited me in to have a drink, you know, not a drink, to go in and have a drink of soda or something, you know. 
Right. Because I didn't drink at that time. But and so, of course, I go in because I am naive, and that was it. He started, he took me into the room and raped me, and his roommate was home and never did anything. And he continued to rape me for a few hours. Oh, my god! And the only way that I finally got him to stop was that I told him that I was pregnant, and he stopped. And luckily enough, thank you, Jesus, he took me home afterwards. But I still never told anyone because I thought it was my fault because I went on a date with a stranger. Well, and plus you'd been programmed from such a young age that it's your fault. Right. Right. Which is what abusers do. Right. They, you know, they, they twist that. They know that they can. Mm -hmm. So they use it against you and twist it. And it's also a really common thing that, that they threaten you with um, either killing or hurting um, someone that you love. Exactly. You know, either you or someone that you love. Right. In the case of me, I didn't ever tell anyone about my abuse as a kid, mm. ever. Um, I couldn't even tell myself about it. I didn't even remember it until I was 30 because wow. it was so bad I had to block it out. Right. But it was his telling me that he was going to kill my mom if I ever told. I'm going to kill your mom if you ever tell anybody. This was my father that was molesting me. And so when I finally remembered, and the very first time I ever spoke the words right, of it, I just waited like, why? Well, I didn't know what was going to happen. Am I going to die? I don't know if it was just going to poof, you know, explode or something. Because I had had it programmed into me for so long. Right. So the first thing I had to do is call my mom. Mm -hmm. I was scared to death that she might be dead. Even all those 30 years later, you know, I mean, that's just how that that kind of mind programming right. works, right. right? And that's what they do. It's so sick that they do that. Yeah. And, you know, and so other, it's good that you are brave enough to come on and share these things. Of course. Because it's important for people to know Absolutely. that that's what they do. That's what they do to you. You don't have to believe them. They're lying. Um, and you don't have to keep going through life blaming yourself. It's exactly. It's not your fault. It's not your it's fault. It's not your fault. You know, exactly. and, and, and this is, you know, if, if anything, this is a lesson for a lot, a lot of people to know. I became vulnerable to the point of uh, marrying an abusive man that I knew was abusive. From before I even knew him. Yeah. But it's because you have low self-esteem, right? you have no self-worth, and you just feel that, you know, this is what you probably deserve, you know? But right. you don't have to do that, you know? Right. You're worth everything in the world. You are number one. And That's exactly right. Yeah. And that is exactly right. You know, I know that um, it led to an abusive marriage for me also. Same thing, you know, that... Um, you just, uh, you think you deserve it. So when I finally remembered my abuse as a kid, I told him, you know what? I used to think I deserve this, but I know better now. Right. This isn't working. Right. But so, okay, so you got out of the marriage, and mm -hmm. I'm so glad you got, and I'm so glad you survived all mm -hmm. of that. How did you do it? Did you just decide that you were going to keep, I mean, because I know you now. Yes. And hard to think of you as a victim because you're such a survivor now. <laughs> so, you I mean, do you have some of, some tricks or some hints or some tips or anything? I mean, I know you went and sort of some of the abuse um, led to the domestic violence and then you finally got out on your own. And I know that you had talked to me a little bit about um, having issues with um, addiction and, and things like that. So. How did that work for well, you? Well, how that I lived through that? all of that was through, with addiction. I ah. had started using um, marijuana at the age of 12, um, started smoking it behind the church during catechism. <laughs> she says, with a, <laughs> Right, God didn't strike me there. <laughs> nope, God loves you right where yes. you are. He does. He loves but you right where, where you are. That's where, how the addiction, it, it wasn't actually an addiction at that time, but um, it, it grows. It's a progressive disease, right? right addiction it is. is. And so then at the age of 15, I started using White Cross Speed and drinking a little bit. I started, uh, did experience with acid, with um, barbiturates. Wow. Um, uh, uh, magic mushrooms, um, 
So then, um, about at the age of 18, I had met my first husband, and um, the drugs and alcohol weren't that much in my life because I had children and, and stuff like that. But to go back a little bit, um, hold on one second. Okay, I'm sorry, because when I instead of going back a little bit, because I want this whole story and, and one thing, and I know we need to take a break right oh, now, okay. and I want everyone to hear this. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a break. I hope you'll come back. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii. See you in a minute. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us. Aloha. Hi, my name is Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review, coming to you from Honolulu, Hawaii, right here in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Asian Review is the oldest of the 35 or so shows um, uh, broadcast by Think Tech Hawaii. We've been in production since 2009. Our goal is to provide you, the viewer, with information, breaking information about events in Asia. Asia being anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan, from the Russian uh, Far East, south to Australia and New Zealand. We hope to see you every Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. Hello, welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii Park. I am Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and I am here with Donita Garcia. And so I want to hear the story of what you were talking about before. Um, I want to make sure that we have enough time to get it all in, too, right? Because there's so much. And I want to make sure we get to the good stuff, too, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so please tell us a little bit more about the addiction and and what you went through and how you how you broke out of it. So the addiction, um, well, I wanted to go back a little bit. My, my grandmother uh, was an alcoholic and left my mother when she was a young age. My mother was an alcoholic and left me when I was a young age. Oh I was an alcoholic addict and left my children when they were young. And my wow. daughter um, is an addict and left her children. But me and my daughter are both sober now. So nice. Yeah, that is a, that's how much, how long have you been I sober? Ha, in June, I'll have seven years. Seven years, that's yes. awesome. And my daughter is going is still in her first year. Nice. Yes. So, but anyway, so the addiction um, went from, um, in my 20s, after I left my first husband um, and my children, because of that and because of all the past things that I had been through, the rapes, and uh, went into cocaine and, and drinking heavily and uh, rock cocaine. And uh, that's Ooh. how I dealt with the abuse from my second husband. Um, to the point, there were many suicide attempts. Wow. Many. Um, uh, and then. God's um, not done with you yet. Not done with me yet. <laughs> I'm glad none of them worked. I ended up in, in, um, in care in a mental institution three different times wow. um, so then it went from my addiction went to ice smoking ice and shooting up ice wow. to um, to where I ended up going homeless um, on the west side and um, I had owned three homes at one time so you know it was just it was just I knew that I wasn't supposed to be there but um, it's just, you know, you have to hit a bottom, and I definitely hit a bottom. And what happened was my youngest daughter was getting married, and she didn't invite me to the wedding. And oh, I didn't wow. want to be awake during that weekend because it was so traumatic for me. Right? So I started taking sleeping pills, one right after the other. Um, and it wasn't a purposeful suicide attempt, but it ended up that way. And I ended up um, uh, coming out a bit at, um, and went to... Uh, Wine Coast Comprehensive, where I told the physician exactly what I had done, and um, he wasn't real pleased with me. He wasn't real nice about what I had been going through. It was actually very mean, but they sent me to Kikela at Queens, and um, I met a very nice social worker there that told me about drug treatment in Hawaii. And in my day and age, drug treatment was only for rich people. So I had no idea that, that, that those services were available to me. But they are available, and they're all over this island, you know, yeah. so look for them. So um, I got an assessment with my mental health case manager, who I was assigned after the suicide attempt, and uh, she took me to Hinamauka, drug treatment in Kaneohe, and um, they accepted me. Nice. And I, 
It's my, an amazing program. Yes, it is. You know, Malcolm, I know a lot of people that have had such great results. Oh, my God. <clears throat> they saved my life. Yeah. You know, Malcolm saved my life. I did not know that I was broken in a thousand pieces until oh. I went there. At, at the age of 55, to, be, to, to look at your life and know that it's not manageable anymore, but which you never knew before because of pride or ego or not knowing that treatment right. is there. You know, and so it saved my life. And um, I spent 42 days in a residential, and then I spent two and a half months in an out, outpatient, and then three months aftercare. Wow. And then I got into a very strict clean and sober house, which every minute had to be accounted for. Wow. And um, I did that purposely because I didn't want any loopholes. You Good know? for you, yeah. right? Yes. Right. So then I, I also got into a 12-step program and um, did all the things that they suggested that I do because um, I didn't want to fail. I wanted Good a new life. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired there you go. Of, of everything. You know, I right. wanted a new life. And, and I you. did well, you know. You have made one. Wow. You have really made one. Mm. I, uh, whew. okay. So let's talk about where you've come from there. You just recently quit smoking even too, didn't you? Next month I make two years. Two years. <laughs> and I smoked for 46 years. Wow. That is amazing to me. I think we have a picture of you in your pretty white shirt, getting ready to go. Weren't you just interviewed on KHON2? Yes, I was. I, I think you were. Yes. I know for all of you out there that um, if you, when you go to the YouTube version of this, well, there'll be a link that you'll be able to follow so that you can see it. Because it's a great program. It's the ending, it's at Castle, right? The end it's smoking? The, it's the uh, Castle Wellness Center, and they have tobacco coaches there. And uh, my tobacco coach was Allie. She was wonderful. She was, she became everything to me when I wanted to quit smoking, and it, um, it helped me. At first, I didn't succeed, but, you know, you could try over and over again. But then the second time that I, I did, you know, and they have patches for you. They have the, the medicine if you need, like Chantex or Wellbutrin. They have... Inhalers, they have gum, they have nicotine, wow. they have everything. You know, so they're they're absolutely there to help you succeed. And you right. don't have to have a quit date right away. You know, you can go into it slowly. But nice. it definitely helped me and I am so glad that I'm smoke free today. It's amazing. So. That's so great. Okay, so this is how and you tell everybody how I know you. I know Donita because we go to school together. And she is remarkable. She has already graduated out of Windward with an associates, right? And then she went on to West Oahu, and she's going to graduate this year, right? May 5th. May 5th she graduates, which is pretty exciting, um, with a degree in administ justice administration. It's going to be a bachelor's degree in justice administration, yeah. That is amazing. To go from where you were Almost to be. where you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is just... And the uh, next step is to, uh, I, I'm applying for uh, KCC for a paralegal program. Okay. Yes. Nice. So paralegal thing, you know, I was just filming today at the Domestic Violence Action Center, um, making a little short documentary about those guys. And... Um, and they have a paralegal that's on site there. And I was thinking of you mm -hmm. because I thought, oh, man, this would be the perfect job for Danita. <laughs> She'd be awesome at this. <laughs> so, and you would be. They'd hire you in a red hot minute. I'm sure they would. It's, uh, it's so hard to try to put all these things together and to try to get to where you are. And it takes so much courage and so much determination. Absolutely. And I hope you're really proud of yourself because you should be. You deserve the best of the best. <laughs> Not the stuff that they told you you deserved or programmed you to think that you deserve because you deserve the best. You are an amazing person. Thank you. Watching the way you work with the kids at TRIO at school, when you come in as a tutor, they all like, I want Donita, I want Donita. Oh yeah, here we go, we've got a picture of your graduation from Winward. Mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. Isn't that you, that's you in the end? Yes, I was also a commencement speaker for my class. Then. All right. Yes, that was pretty cool. She's wearing all the, 
honors. You were Phi Theta Kappa. Was, Give us a Phi list of all the things you were, because you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I went back to school, I wanted to make sure that I did everything, because I knew I was only going get to get to do it one time, and I wanted to get out right. of the box. So I guess the first thing that happened is we, we were in the very first debate club at Windward, and when we went to Manoa for the national for the state championships, we won. Nice. Then I went into student government, and I was a senior for one year and a vice president for one year. Wow. Then I was indicted into Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society, and I became president of the Honor Society for two years. That is a hard job. Yes, that is a really hard job. <laughs> all actually, all of those are pretty hard, but but I know for a fact that that the Phi Theta Kappa one is just really hard to do. And I was a math, I've been a math tutor at Windward for five years, and I was. I was Cynthia's math tutor. It's the only reason I was able to pass math, okay? Because me and math, oh my gosh, that whole semester I was just like, ah, I can't do it, I can't do it. Save me, don't need to save me. I sat on many different committees at Windward, and um, I've been in aesthetics committee, planning and budget committee, safety committee. I've done some things with sustainability. And now at West Oahu, I am treasurer of the Law Society Club. Ah. So I've made sure that I've enjoyed every minute of my, my college experience that I have. It's been just amazing. I, I can't even imagine. But every, since the day I got clean and sober, almost seven years ago, I have been blessed every single day in one way or another. You know, and it's just doing the right thing every single day and believing in yourself and believing that, you know, you can, no matter what, no matter what age, you can. Oh, you know, God. Just get that is like, you know, we've only got another minute here. And what you just said is exactly the, the, the best thing we could ever end with, I think, right there. That's just like, that says it all. That, that says it all right there. That was just beautiful. I'm so grateful that... I know you. I'm so grateful that you came on my show. Hello. So um, when you're when you're working as a paralegal, you can come back and tell us all about the survivors that you're helping and all the different things. But I'm trying to figure out when you had time to take a breath while you were in school. <laughs> I did it really. Because that was some, I can't even imagine trying to do that much stuff. Donita, thank you so much Thanks. for coming. I'm serious. Thank you. I love you. I love you too, darling. Thank you so much for being here with me. So all of you out there, um, I know you're feeling pretty lucky too to just have been able to hear that story. It's a powerful story. So if you have a story that you want to tell, send it to me, Survivor Central at thinktechhawaii.com. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos on thinktechhawaii.com. Thanks for joining us. Come back again.